<laughs> Hello, everybody. So good to see you all. For those of you with your cameras on, of course, if you can put your camera on, it'd be great to see your face. If not, we understand. Uh, I want to welcome everyone. My name is Andrew Engel, and I'm senior programmer at Reimagine. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, I'm a white cisgender male with glasses, salt and pepper hair. I've got a flannel shirt on with different patterns because it's fall, sweater weather. And um, I've got a bright orange background. Um, today, my colleague, Misha Jane, who is our director of growth at Reimagine, is helping out on this call. Thank you, Misha. Everyone say hi to Misha. Uh, Reimagine is a nonprofit organization catalyzing a uniquely powerful community. People of different backgrounds, ages, races, and faiths, people of no faith, all coming together in the hopes of healing ourselves and the world. We specifically support each other in facing adversity, loss, and mortality, and actively channeling life's biggest challenges into meaningful action and growth. And we're honored today to co-host this event with the National Council on Aging. NCOA is the national voice for every person's right to age well. Working with thousands of national and local partners, NCOA provides resources, tools, best practices, and advocacy to ensure that every person, regardless of race, gender, sexual, sexuality, income, or zip code, can age with health and financial security. You can learn all about NCOA using the link that we're pasting in the chat for you. In this series, we're moving through an arc of learning about aging through the lens of grief and through the lens of growth. We're discovering, um, and it's not so obvious, that getting older is a mix of both the grief and the growth. Um, it's not one or the other. We began our first session uh, with learning about what it means to be an elder. And part of that is having a fluency in managing change. That's, what, that's how you become an elder. Um, passing on what you know, but at the same time, being open to learning something new. And perhaps your teacher is a generation or two younger than you. Um, you can get a playback um, of, of these events um, by going to a link that Misha will paste in the chat. Um, you'll also get a, a recording of this discussion um, in a few days um, in your inbox. So be on the lookout for that. Um, we're interested in knowing where you're all zooming in from. Uh, please put that in the chat if you haven't done so already. Um, and there's a very helpful map called native-land.ca. And you can check that out to learn about locations of indigenous people in your area. For example, I'm in Manhattan. It's also known as New York, a city located on the unceded land of the Lenape people. Uh, for those who wish, click on the CC icon to get a live transcript of what's being said. You can save the chat by clicking on the three dots in the chat box and feel free to send me or Misha a note in the chat privately if you have any technical issues. We might be able to help you. Uh, again, everyone who registered for this discussion will get a follow-up email with the recording. Okay, now I can see you all better. Um, last week, the team from Old School led us in an undoing ageism workshop in which we honored age-related loss. We had a gentleman with us who shared that he used to be a hospice chaplain. And he talked about the importance of having another human being present uh, for someone. Um, he recalled a story about a patient who was near the end of her life and he asked her what she wanted. 
And her response was, I want someone to rock me. She only weighed about 80 pounds. So this man lifted her up, put her in the nurse's arms and she rocked her and it gave her so much peace. Um, this chaplain who was on our call went on to share that he lost two of his children and how much he wanted someone to hold him. So of course we all gave him virtual hugs um, and rocks. Um, social isolation and the loss of human touch is very real. And there are so many other kinds of aging related loss. Um, we'll hear about the loss of employment today and income. Um, invisibility is another kind of, uh, visibility is another kind of loss that we can experience as we age. Um, and how can we transform these varied losses into action? That's what today's session is about. And we're in very good hands today. We've got Sean Pierre Regis, a filmmaker who directed, produced, and self-distributed the debut feature documentary, Duty Free. Um, and if you need an emotional pick-me-up, please stream it or buy it. Um, it was just announced that Sean Pierre is a 2024 New America Fellow. Congratulations, Sean Pierre. Um, uh, Raising Adults is his latest podcast project that will uplift stories of modern families who, by choice or by circumstance, are living multi-generationally multi today. Um, we've got Rebecca Danagelis sitting next to Sean Pierre. Uh, the 80 year old star of her son's film, Duty Free. She has uh, more than double, um, more Instagram followers than Sean Pierre. I just have to <laughs> say that she's the star here. Um, we'll hear more about Rebecca's experiences with ageism and navigating employment as an older adult. She's an activist and a public speaker. And finally, we've got Susan Silberman, who serves as Senior Director of Research and Evaluation at the National Council on Aging. She has worked in communities across the United States, particularly underrepresented communities, including Native Americans and Indigenous people, um, to help them with program evaluation. We'll learn from Susan why research and evaluation are key steps towards action, and social change. You can read their full bios in the event listing. Misha's pasting that link in the chat as well. Um, let's start with the film. We're gonna show you a trailer now from Duty Free. It's about a minute and a half, and then we'll all come back. This is my mom, Rebecca. Hello. She raised me and my brother in a tiny apartment. To make ends meet, my mom spent 50 years as a hotel housekeeper, and she always assumed she'd have a job. Smile. When I went to college, she cast out her savings to put me through school. Then all of a sudden, her story took a turn. I just got fired. They walked me up. I've seen it happen with other people in my age group. Her story was more universal than we could have ever imagined. There ain't no reason anybody's gonna hire somebody that's 75 years of age. I want you to write out a list of all the things you could never do, kind of like a bucket list, and I want to do them. I couldn't get my mom a job, but what I could do was tell her story. Mom, you are on the homepage of USA Today. Wow. Hello from Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. <laughs> India, China, Argentina, reaching out, understanding the story. One of the great joys of being a mother is to see love come out in simple ways. 77! You have one chance at life. For God's sake, live it the way that makes you comfortable. Let's see your best hip-hop move. <laughs> it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. This is your life. Wow. I never get tired of watching that trailer. I hope the two of you don't get tired of it. Um, 
Maybe a little bit. I don't know. You've, you've, you've played it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I mean, I actually just have, I haven't watched it in a very long time. And there's so much joy in it. So yeah, no, I'm very happy. Uh, I love to watch it back whenever I can. And it sort of brings me back to the moment, you know? I mean, the five years that it took to make that film, um, the experience that sort of forged us together. Um, years now. I'm 83 now. My mom's now almost 80, it, I'm 82. 82. Yeah. 82. Um, yeah, just a wild moment. I'm so happy I got the opportunity to do that and uh, took the risk to sort of tell my mom's story um, on my own terms. And Sean Pierre, this is your first film. Previously, most of your work has been in journalism. So I'm curious, when was that moment as this was unfolding, your mom is sacked from this job at the hotel after so many years of service. This is all unfolding in front of you. You're filming, but I'm. are you thinking that this is a, a documentary film that you're making? When was that moment? No, not at all. So I was working as a contributor at CNN. Um, so I would bring stories uh, weekly to television around, it could be anything from pop culture to social justice movements, like the Black Lives Matter movement, etc. Um, my mom called me one day and well, had been calling me and telling me, you know, something's not right. This feels weird. I don't know why they're asking me this and this. And, um, and we were both kind of just really questioning. And so I would go up to Boston um, to sort of just be with her as she was sort of really lonely. I mean, to be lonely in your work um, when that is your purpose. I mean, she and really, I where I work. and she lived where she worked. So it was, it was, she was really alone. And so I would go visit her, but then I thought the journalist piece of me was like, well, why don't I tape, you know, how you're feeling and what you're feeling and what they said to you and this and that, just in case if anything happened, um, we would at least have that documentation in real time. Um, and it wasn't until I got the call that she was fired that I realized, oh my God, like this is much bigger than these small scenarios, you know, like this is a real issue. Um, and then at that point, as I saw her sort of devolve into pure sadness, um, having lost her purpose and her paycheck, um, I thought, okay, what is what is the one thing that I can do to take my best friend and teammate out of this misery? And that's when I came up with the bucket list idea. And it was at that point that both the bucket list idea and all these crazy adventures that we were about to do alongside how she was going to actually survive this great loss, I realized then, okay, this is a feature film. This There's enough space here and enough story here um, to make it into something really substantive. To be honest, you know, the film, the version that I watched was an hour long, but I felt like it could have kept going. <laughs> oh God, there was a lot that we cut out. Uh, so if you don't know, obviously you saw the trailer, but we went on multiple bucket list adventures and there were so many things that we just couldn't keep in. Like one thing that's not in the film um, is that my mom uh, walked the Boston Marathon, which you know is 26.2 miles in the middle of the summer, dead heat. She was like 77, I'm 78 that time. Bad. Still brown <laughs> from that. Um, and so there were just a lot of things that we got to do that are now just like internal memories for us in footage that nobody else has seen that maybe one day we'll release. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, Rebecca, your story of job loss is but one of many. Uh, and I'm curious maybe to bring Susan into this conversation. And I think the two of you as well, you know, I'm just curious about what kind of recourse is there for those who have been laid off? Um, and you know how successful can one be in arguing that this is a case of discrimination, particularly ageism? Very, very difficult to prove. That's why now, having having been through this, the secret is that the first point somebody says something or asks you to transfer things over or give up your files and all that, start documenting. Document, document, on this day, this happened, and. Because to suddenly lose your job and say, it's age, it's age, what proof do you have? And, and in my case, what happened was, I'd set this place up as a hotel. It wasn't a hotel before, it was an apartment building, very successful little hotel. 
And then the people who are managing it or the owners decided to sell the building. Well, I'm not knowing they're selling the building. I'm not knowing anything about that. And it's now sold to a very nice company, but um, there's no, there was no conversation. I should have questioned more. I should have. And, you know, just um, <clears throat> from my experience being her proxy and never have experiencing this before. I mean, listen, I was 32 at the time. Uh, ageism never was something that I thought about. Right. I mean, why would I? Uh, or the, me. Or, or, I mean, or you. I mean, you were 75. Everybody telling <laughs> the speedos who I am. Yeah. So we were both kind of like, what the heck is going on? And as I sort of grasped for sticks and straws and clues and um, I talked to various lawyers who said, listen, unless you have an email that says uh, this lady's too old, yeah. um, it is very, very hard to prove. Um, despite the fact that we have, you know, age discrimination laws in place, it has become very, very hard to prove. Um, and so, you, you know, for us, we made the decision to not fight it in the that legal way. sense, but rather to use what we knew how to do, which was to tell a story, to tell our story really personally. And frankly, in retrospect, I'm so happy that we took that route because I think we moved a lot more people to the action tool. than having this be a personal thing that went through the, the court system. I have hundreds of emails from people. This happened to me. This happened to my dad. This happened to my mom from all over the world. The same thing. Yeah. Susan, I'm curious to hear from you about the power of storytelling and the work of the National Council on Aging and how, you know, you see that play out in terms of action and advocacy. Um, I'm going to start a little bit by backtracking because um, I want to make sure that folks who are here know that issues around um, age discrimination have been taken out of employment uh, protections legally. Uh, and so there are much fewer uh, opportunities for older adults and people who feel that they've experienced uh, ageism to actually move forward with the extent of uh, coverage uh, and representation through the laws than we had previously. So I think that's important. The other thing I feel like it's important to talk about is the breadth of um, age discrimination. Over a third of people that apply for jobs deal with age discrimination. Um, either they experienced it as reported, um, they anticipated in terms of the uh, job descriptions and how people are uh, channeled through that process. But then once you even have a job, people are dealing with age discrimination in terms of how people are treated, words that are used, the tasks that are assigned. So it is, it is, it is present in our society in a very significant way. And I think it's important to hold that up because what uh, Rebecca experiences is not, is not unique. It's unique in the sense that it happened to her. It's unique in the sense that she was well positioned, which I'll be here to tell this amazing story. But there are, it's happening every day um, all over this country. Um, and we don't have nearly the kind of protections that we used to have um, in uh, employment. So you asked, I'm sorry, that was sort of a little sideline, Andy. Um, oh, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you brought that in. I did ask you a question though about the role of storytelling in the work of NCOA. I think that I think that the storytelling is part and parcel of everything that we do. I don't think that you can do and move forward and talk about shared experiences unless there's storytelling. I think you know there are probably of the folks that are on this call, everybody has their own story and their own experience with issues around age discrimination more likely. Even people who are young experience it or are aware of it because it touches people in our lives. I think even if you don't know what's happened to you directly, it's hard not to acknowledge that it's happening around you. The stories that NCUA collects are part and parcel of all the work that we do. Um, one of the things that we have on the NCUA website under Take Action, along with being able to sign up for um, our newsletters, is a section called Take Action. And one of the things they ask folks to do is to share stories. What has happened to you? How have you experienced um, issues around Medicare enrollment? How have you experienced access to food? Um, are you food insecure? Are the food benefits that you receive, if you receive them, covering the kind of uh, foods that you need. So um, stories, I, I don't think you can separate that. Um, we're about holding up stories because at the end of the day, we want to serve and bring people's voices forward. I think the only thing that brings change, honestly, is when people share their stories and those stories are elevated. Thank you. So I, I'm curious, 
what resources are out there for older adults to keep them in the workplace, to, you know, help them with job finding and other kinds of professional development? I don't know. I mean, there, there's, there are clearly all sorts of things out there. I don't know that all of them are specific to older adults. Um, I think that what I think about with older adults is that so many of the ways that people make information available um, is electronically. Um, I think there's something that's tremendously limiting about that approach because not everybody has access to computers. No, not everybody has access to internet and not everybody who has access to internet and has a computer knows how to use a computer effectively. And those are true. That's true for people who are aging, but that's also just true when you think about um, sort of uh, cross cultures. Um, that's a very, I think, a very white middle class approach to thinking about jobs. And I think we need to do better because I think there are a lot of other ways um, when I think about, for instance, the power of radio. Um, but I think there are resources both at the federal level, um, at the state level, um, you know, again, things that are mostly online. Ideally, there are things that are available in multiple languages that are um, culturally responsive so that there are notices and information available not only in a myriad of languages, but in places where people who, you know, represent the breadth of uh, Americans go. So community centers and grocery stores um, and things like that. Rebecca, maybe I can kick this back to you about, you know, what was most helpful for you when you lost your job in terms of finding support, in terms of finding a community of other folks in your situation? Well, I think it was mostly, first of all, Jean-Pierre that really got me on the Instagram and everything. And again, I experienced ageism even trying to apply for a job on the internet. I mean, I went to college when I was 11 years of age. I had a good education. I learned everything in rhyme. We didn't have computers. I can still tell you anything in rhyme from pronouns to lakes in Canada because we learned on ahead. I never, I, I know the things that are on the computer. I still don't know. But on, on Instagram, I learned there's a whole big world of people who lost their jobs just like me. But on the computer, I'm going to apply for a job and it says, Date last finished high school, scroll down. And you scroll down, it stops at 1979. So you think, oh, they've made a mistake here. And application incomplete, discarded. Well, now we have what I did learning from this is to make other people aware of this. We now have the Pluchka Act, protector of, of older Americans in the job application process. They cannot do that. They cannot ask you, you know, to do that. It has to be the same to, for everybody. But again, opening up the computer and learning the computer and learning where I can get information, speaking to other people in the same situation. And thank you for the Council of Aging and, and those, those organizations that spend their time helping other Americans. It's, uh, if I can jump in here, I think it's really, really difficult. And to put a bow on this conversation, this part of the conversation is that I, being my mom's proxy throughout this, um, I learned as she learned. And one thing I will say is that for as much talk as there is around job placement, replacement, re-education of older Americans, I haven't actually seen it done very well. Yeah. Um, I think that there are tons of people, to Susan's point, who uh, by culture, by education, by location, by there are so many factors that a blanket fix will not help. And even there are some organizations where they that's what they do. They tout being able to place older Americans. You'll go to the website. There are no jobs available for them. Um, so what do you do then? Um, and then people are in crisis. And so anyway, um, what has been helpful for my mom and for us uh, in particular is to be able to a speak about it but mo most importantly create a community where if you need immediate help whether that's in a Facebook forum or on an Instagram post or an email uh, exchange like to create a community of folks who are struggling through the same thing yeah. um, so that at least even if you don't get a lead to a job you get a help from afar you get you know you get a I'm struggling with this too, and here's what I know. No, and I yeah. think that that is what's really missing. Yes. 
John Pierre, maybe we can go now to this topic that you're exploring on your podcast on housing. You know, um, I'm just curious, based on who you've spoken with, um, the stories that you've collected so far, what excites you in terms of um, new opportunities for intergenerational housing? Yeah, great question. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, the numbers, what I, what is fascinating to me about this new project is, so after the film was over, my mom moved in with me and my partner in New York City. And we lived together for three years up until just this last May. And um, as I was thinking about what my next project would be, I thought, you know, wow, well, this is hard. <laughs> um, this is interesting. You know, there are layers here. And if if I knew anything from my last project, it was when I was in emotional distress, um, it was a great way for me to create art because I was able to sort of process what I was going through, through the art that I was creating. And so that was sort of why I wanted to investigate multi-generational housing. How do people do it was the question, right? Like, how do we, how do I um, allow my mom full autonomy um, uh, as an adult, but living in the house that I have created as an adult. And one key question that I had was, how do you raise a house of adults while grappling to become one yourself? And that was the question that I continued to ask myself through the hardest of times. Um, then I did some research and recognized that multi-generational housing is on the rise in this country and in a country in which we, that was, that is not part of our DNA, you know, like a lot of folks, I mean, a, a, a lot of folks, particularly um, uh, in cultural narratives, um, did not live with their parents, right? Like you sort of either sent them off or you figured out your own way to live, very capitalist, if you will. Um, of course, there were black and brown people, uh, immigrants and such who had always done that, but they didn't really lead the cultural narrative. So in America, nobody thought to live with their parents. Anyway, that number is on the rise for financial reasons, because we have a larger population of uh, immigrants, um, et cetera. And so we are living in a country now where we have to wrestle with that. How do we do it? And I've talked to people who, um, you know, a Japanese woman who said, you know, there's a Japanese fable where the swan, this swan is dating um, this guy and he needs to sell his wares in um, the market to make some money. And so she, has to basically, she plucks out her feathers to create a sweater for him to sell at the market. And she said, as a caregiver living with my parent as an adult, I sometimes think like about being that swan and how many more feathers do I need to pull out oh, yeah. from my own life to give to them. Um, and so they have those, then you have some who say, you know, this is the best experience of my life. I've been able to recalibrate my relationship with my parent in a way I could have never done before. Um, and so I'm just hearing lots of powerful stories and trying to like really create the through line between them all, because I think we need education in this country around how to do that right. Um, and we need also to feel seen in the experience um, because it's a very, hard experience, but also a wonderful rite of passage if you're able to to get there. Sorry, that was such a long-winded answer, but I brought you through the whole project and it all. So I hope you were inspired a little bit. <laughs> I was, I was. You know, I've been reading more and more articles about this phenomenon of intergenerational housing. You know, so many articles about um, ADUs, yeah. you know, these accessory, accessory dwelling units, like the Brand tiny blocks. houses. If you're lucky enough to have a backyard, you might be able to build something for a parent or a grandparent behind you. Um, we live in the city, so it's, um, I live in the city and you live in the city. So that's something that's not an option for most of us living in cities like this. But, you know, I'm, I've also, I'm familiar with folks who have made the choice to live in a co-housing community. That's another example. Susan, I'm curious, you know, um, what NCOA um, has been, you know, has been supporting people with in terms of housing? Well, I think, well, I mean, I think that Trump here is right. There are, there's an enormous amount of growth in uh, multi-generational families. I think census data uh, is further of that. I think that some of it 
you know, you can say, oh, it was the pandemic, but it was before the pandemic. I think that as the countries become more diverse, um, it has become more reflective of different kinds of people um, and work, you know, multi-generational families are much more common outside of uh, white America. And as a consequence of that, it's something we need to be, you know, more aware of. I think that one of the things that NCUA thinks about when we think about multi-generational is we have to talk about caregiving, right? Because many people live with family members and, um, and a lot of it is about caregiving. Caregiving for the most part falls upon women um, at any stage of your life from when you're raising children to when you're taking care of your own parents or your in-laws or your extended family. Um, and so we talk a lot about issues of caregiving, of the kind of resources that we want to have available, um, not unlike what Rebecca was talking about. You know, there needs to be communities of practice. There needs to be places for people to come together to talk about it, because you, as you think and you process in those and you find support and all those things are things that are not as uh, widely known, but should totally be covered and be th things you talk about. Um, so you want support as you're struggling with and trying to figure out how to live together, how to provide care for a loved one. Um, and then, of course, there's the issue of respite care, um, you know, and how one provides uh, solace and breaks for the people that are doing the caregiving. Um, it's an enormous part of the economy. Um, it's something that's highly underfunded. One of the areas that NCOA has been working on really hard is finding ways to financially support family caregivers. Because it's you know it's a it's millions if not billions of dollars. I think that ARP had a study that they put out annually on how much caregiving costs this country. It's part of the economy that's not really acknowledged, and it's something that we uh, need to do a better job and bring forward and making sure that there are ways to support the American families that are providing this care that is not in any way being covered. Because if you are a person, a man or a woman, and you take time off of your job or caregiving, it costs you money and therefore cost the economy money. I wanna keep going with this caregiving topic, but I wanna take a pause and let everyone know in this community here that if you have questions for Susan, for Sean pierre for Rebecca, please put them in the chat. I'm hoping we will have time for Q&A. Um, and I did wanna give you all a heads up that a signature of this third session in our series is that we're gonna go into breakout rooms with a series of prompts. So I just wanted to give you a heads up about that. That we'll, we'll try to do that in about 10 minutes from now. So now on the topic of caregiving, um, I'm gonna ask a rather personal question for Jean-Pierre and Rebecca now, cause you know, it's important to plan. It's important to have these kinds of conversations. And you know, Rebecca at 75, you were jumping out of airplanes. Um, but I don't know, you know, if you'll be jumping out of airplanes, you know, 10 years from now. And, you know, I'm curious if you and your son have had these kinds of conversations about the future and caregiving and planning and all of that. Absolutely. And I think that's the main thing is to have a conversation. And you're older and as I am, is to have a conversation with your family about what's next. We, I had never planned I always thought I'd be in the hotel they'd carry me out in my box and that would be it I never thought about living longer and and, and who was going to take care of this that and the other so to have that conversation that now he has my power of attorney and to make the plans and talk to your parents or talk to your brother what do you plan how would you like to see your life evolve what plans have you made for when you're older or will it be at home where you're going to live how, how can we but have that conversation with your family yeah, ahead of time. Yeah, it's a difficult conversation. I think throughout yeah. this process, I had a lot of anticipatory grief and I still do. I mean, I guess that's part of the theme here um, around losing my mom and what would happen. And I think that grief for a while um, sort of stop me from wanting to engage in the conversation around what happens next. Um, and I think, thankfully, I was able to have a bit of lead time. My mom is still alive <laughs> and finally came around to being able to um, ask the really thought provoking questions. I mean, some are practical questions like, 
do you want to be buried or do you want to be cremated or do you want to be like what kind of what do you want um to the more uh like nitty-gritty you know sort of getting the power of attorney and what do finances look like and who takes care of my brother and all of those type of That's questions um which are sometimes really hard and and sometimes maybe you can't even plan fully but at least i have um a general sense um, because I think if I learned anything from the film, it is that reacting from a place of crisis is um, one of the, uh, not worst is the bad word, but sort of the hardest places to move from. Um, and so the most planning, the more planning that you can do the, the stronger you can be with every stride that you take toward the inevitable resolution. And as a Queen's guy, be prepared is my motto. That's what I say. Be prepared to people. Be prepared. I wasn't prepared. Although I was a Queen's guy, I was not prepared for this. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, we all age. It's a universal truth. Um, and, you know, our experiences of aging, we've talked about this, it depends on your zip code, it depends on your race, your ethnicity, your immigration status, uh, sexual orientation. How can we all be better allies to older adults who come from underrepresented communities? What should we know and what can we do? Susan, can I kick this off to you? Oh, so be it, I'm Pierre first. Um, uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> They're hard questions, Andy. Um, I think that the first thing you do is you have to listen because it goes back to your question about storytelling. I think people need to be able to feel like they can talk about it and share their own personal experiences and be heard. Um, I think that there are a lot of assumptions about how people live and the impacts of how they live happening in this country. And they don't always necessarily reflect the reality of how we live. You know, we were talking about caregiving. Um, and, you know, the need for tax credits um, and the need for supports for family caregivers. But the other thing we need to talk about, quite honestly, is the fact that there are not enough direct care workers out there. Um, it, there's a, it, a, at a time when the economy needs more workers and we don't have enough workers to fill restaurants and to fill all sorts of other jobs in the direct care for workforce, this is a big issue. We need to find people that want to work. And that means that we need, you know, people who want to have good jobs where they feel like they have stability, they get good wages, they have benefits, they have opportunity for training and they have the opportunity, you know, for promotion. Um, those are the kinds of things that bring people to jobs. I think that when you think about, you know, how to make this a country that is gonna honor people across the lifespan, we have a lot of work to do. There are a lot of opportunities. Um, Rebecca and Jean-Pierre, do you have any reflections before we move into our breakout session on this uh, question? I just want to say that I've spent a lifetime of hiring people who are immigrants. Very few Americans apply for jobs in housekeeping. And in fact, to this date, when I asked anybody coming in for a job, why do you want to work here? Nobody has ever said, I like to clean. The jobs I'm offering them are housekeepers or housemen, a hard job, backbreaking job. And I say, why do you want to work? Well, it suits my hours. I'm sending money to Peru or China or whatever. My child goes to school and this and that and the other. The money is good. I can do this. Please give me a job. I've taken those people and made them strong because they've taught me a lot. What did you do in your own country? Well, I worked in accounting. I now have a controller of a major hotel in Boston. He was a houseman. You've got girls who have three better jobs than I ever had because we took the time. People, we need people to spend time with the immigrants, the people who are doing the work, the team building. That's what we need. We need companies more invested in their employees. And for me, I mean, I think uh, this is all individual, right? Like for me, the way that I think about that question is it's not in my best interest to sort of tell broad, say sort of broad things. But for me, what I'm committed to is creating more narratives that reflect the live realities of Americans today. And that's why I'm working on the podcast and hopefully a TV show afterwards, because it is unconscionable to me that we can have millions of folks 
who are in, in for this next project's case, living multi-generationally. And yet there is, there is not one television show that is currently running on TV that shows that in a real way. There is not one, you know, talk show where you're sitting a family down who's living multi-generationally and talking about how hard that is. Where are the shows about caregiving when everybody is basically an unpaid caregiver in this country? Um, and so my job is to forcibly make Hollywood say, listen, there's money to be made here, but more importantly, we can do some good along the way by making sure that people see themselves on screen. Yes, 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 yes. A friend of mine who's on this call, uh, a beloved Reimagine collaborator, shared with me that family caregivers provide an estimated 36 billion hours of care to aging parents, spouses, and other family members. Um, it's something that we, I don't think about very often, um, and we all should be thinking about this. Now is our time to go into breakout sessions. I have three questions for you, and Misha will be pasting these in the chat. Um, I don't want you to discuss all three questions. I think you should each pick one question that speaks to you and respond to it. And then we'll all come back after 10 minutes, okay? So the first question is, can you share any insights about yourself resulting from any loss or grief you may be experiencing due to aging? And at the same time, can you name at least one new opportunity or see one new pathway that may have cleared? The second question is, what works for you in terms of regulating difficult emotions you may be feeling about aging. Maybe it's some sort of mindfulness. Maybe it's having a chat with a friend. Maybe it's being out in nature. Um, that's something that you can share with your group. And the third question is, are there small steps that you can take to move through your own struggles with aging? And similarly, what acts of service, advocacy, or forms of activism might help you navigate your own aging related losses and experiences of ageism, either personally or collectively. So um, get ready to go in. I'm gonna get this going here. Um, so we're going to have, I'm gonna do around three to five per room. Okay, so now I'm gonna open the rooms. Please join. If you don't wanna join a group, you don't have to. You can hang out with us in the main room, but we're gonna do this for about 10 minutes and we will see you soon, okay? And I'm gonna make sure no one's in a room by themselves. Misha, can you help me spot also to make sure we're, yeah, we're not taking out? Um, good problem. Probably, let's see. I think it's okay to leave two people in a room because we don't have a you know a whole lot of time. It looks okay to me. We can ask that. All right, rooms will close in 45 seconds. Welcome back, everybody. 
I hope you had a good breakout experience with your groups. Okay, everyone should be back now. Sorry that we didn't have more time for you folks. I hope your discussions were rich and interesting and you all got to share some reflections on this topic. I would encourage all of you um, to use the chat now. And if there's anything in particular that struck you in your conversations with others, if you wanna share that, um, we'd love to see that in the chat. Um, we have a bit of time for some Q&A also. So um, if anyone has a question, um, please raise your hand. Uh, we've got these three wonderful speakers. I see Patricia here. Go ahead and unmute. Hi, everybody. I'm Patricia Greenberg. Um, I have a business called Eat Well, Live Well, Age Well, and I host a show on YouTube discussing all aspects of aging well. Um, one of the things I want to mention, I mentioned in my small group, we had my mother-in-law live to be 103. And so we had my mother-in-law um, at 103, my husband at 70. She died on his 70th birthday. My stepson, who is in his 40s, myself, um, I'm in my early 60s at the time. Seven years ago, I was in my late 50s. And then I have a teenager in the house at the time. She's now in college. So we had, I mean, could you imagine we had like 15 to 100 all living in the house together? And I was mentioning to my my little cohort, my little group, um, you know, we're so materialistic and so capitalistic that you think you have to have a six bedroom house to for everybody to live together. And that's not the case. Um, I think we should embrace it. I think it was amazing that my teenage daughter had a hundred year old grandmother living in the house with her. I mean, who does that anymore? Plus my mother-in-law was a European Holocaust survivor. And that is a, you know, my daughter, as horrible a situation that was, my daughter learned so much from, you know, that experience. Um, part two is that we um, Medicaid, um, Susan, you may you may know a little more about this, but family members can get certified by Medicare for in-home care. It doesn't cover a lot of things, but you can actually get a paycheck from Medicare if you're taking care of a family member. Um, you have to go through a training process um, and it every little bit helps. Yes, that, that is, as far as I understand, Patricia, that is accurate. Um, yes. There's not enough medical leave or care, yes. um, you know, tax credits for these folks, but there are there are uh, circumstances under which uh, they will pay for family care. Yes. Mm -hmm. Susan asked this question before before all of you came in, and she was curious if there could be either a show of hands or in the chat. How many of you are actively caregiving for a family member right now? Yeah. There was a question for you, Jean Pierre. Um, oh, um, Yoon He, there's a question here. Um, and there's a question from Marilyn. I'm going to start with the first one I saw, which from which is for you, Jean Pierre. What is the biggest learning about aging that you've gained from all this experience with your mom? Um well, I mean, there are the broad strokes, which are like invisibility is horrible and terrible. You know, I, I guess like for me, um, it pulled me out of this society in which everything is catered to me, where, you know, and, and made me realize that this is a capsule moment and that I too will age like my mom, that I will not, that, that I too will be pushed aside unless I become a voice for this. Unless I use this moment, this capsule moment um, to say like, not one more. Um, and so I guess that's what I've learned is, um, is how horrible it, it can feel to feel invisible in a society in which you were one time, one time so visible. Thank you. 
There was a question also from Yunhi and Marilyn. I don't know if Yunhi and Marilyn are still here. Um, let's see. I think they may have left. Um, I'm curious, Rebecca, to hear from you. What's left on your bucket list? What 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 what's what are you going to do next? I am going to get a law pass that there must be a last page in every employee handbook. You know, when you're on the first page, oh, welcome to XYZ, you get three weeks vacation, six sick days, healthcare, blah, 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 June 401, the last page. This is what will happen on your last day of work. If you terminate willingly, we thank you for your service, you'll get the vacation pay you cannot collect, you may receive a reference, you may be eligible for rehab. B, you're fired for poor work or willful neglect, violation of policy. You will not be able to collect. You will receive your vacation pay. You will not receive any job reference and you're not eligible for rehab. C, me. You are restructured or laid off. You will receive your vacation pay. You will receive, you will receive your unemployment. You can collect unemployment. You will receive reference. You may be eligible for rehire at some future point. And um, you will receive 60 days of such restructuring. Do not call me to the office on a Friday afternoon. And we have had to chat, Rebecca. I'm sorry, dear. Today's your last day. We're restructuring. Hmm. Don't want it like that. What a world in which. I want that <laughs> last page in every handbook. And I think it's only fair. You give yourself Her lips to God's ears. That's what I'm working on. I know. Her bucket list used to be skydiving now no, no. as an advocate. Her bucket Everybody list is else. policy. So <laughs> people. That's, that's what I'm working on. Well, folks, um, it's uh, almost two o'clock. Um, we have to wrap up. And I'm just so grateful that we had Susan Silverman, um, Shampia Regis, and Rebecca Denagelis with us today to help us take those steps towards change and action. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Um, I want everyone to know that we have an event next Wednesday that I hope you'll join us for. It is our monthly candlelight vigil, also virtual. Uh, since 2020, we've been hosting these gatherings for people to publicly mourn their losses. Um, we have two wonderful guests, um, and looking at the way Jean-Pierre and Rebecca are dressed today, um, I think it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful serendipity that we have our guests from, uh, um, from, uh, Advanced Style. Maybe you've heard of this blog and this documentary film and this, these photo books, but it was started by a gentleman, uh, who's now in his 40s. Um, um, named Ari, who just started to fall in love with these older women and gentlemen who are dressed fabulously on the streets. And he documented them and like, why should we stop being so fashionable and stylish as we get older? Why we should we need to refuse invisibility in society and just be wonderful? And um, they're gonna talk about grief. They're gonna talk about loss and fashion and clothing as a way to move through our losses. So I hope you'll join us for that. Um, and uh, I wanna thank everyone who has already donated to Reimagine for this free event. And if you have anything else to give, please do so. And uh, I wanna say goodbye to everyone. Um, Susan, Jean-Pierre and Rebecca, thank you so much. And we hope to see you all soon at other Reimagine events. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye bye.